So I want to talk to you today, Martin, about your book, This Life, Why Mortality Makes Us Free. And the first thing I want to ask you is about the success of the book. Now, the last time we met, in person that is, was in York, and we were talking to a mutual friend of ours, if you remember, shout out to Adam, and I think you you said to me that you were going to do a work that collected your thoughts, basically. And I was expecting like a pop book, sort of a book of pop philosophy. And uh, I think this is what turned out, this life. <laughs> and it was like, it's not, it's, so it's not a work of pop philosophy. It's a work of, uh, well, it's all sorts of metaphysics, philosophy, value, questions of time, finitude, political economy. Uh, it's had got a great cut through. The the guy from The Cure, you're on magazine covers, all of this. I said, but I'm just wondering, like, what, what do you think is in it that has made it so popular? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good place to start because I think when I when I first conceived the book and started working on it, it was sort of inspired by the level of response I had received from my previous academic books. So I would receive letters or emails from people who normally didn't read academic books but were taken with a number of my fundamental arguments about existential questions of life, uh, mortality, these sorts of issues that I've been working on for a long time. So my first idea was to do something that academics tend to do when they write books for a broader audience, that is to say, you take ideas that you worked out before and you give them a more accessible form. That was my first idea for the book. But as I started doing that, that was very unsatisfactory to me. And instead, I wanted to write my most ambitious book, but in a maximally accessible idiom. So, and I, th I think that's in itself unusual because again when academics do these crossover books it's usually to do a more accessible version of something that they worked out whereas i wanted to work out original ideas and take my own thinking further but with the sort of constraint that i had to be as accessible and as vivid as possible and that that was a very delicate balancing act but one that i learned a lot through both in terms of writing and thinking because at no point did I want to sacrifice conceptual, philosophical, or technical precision in the issues I was dealing with. But at the same time, I became hyper vigilant vis-a-vis -vis falling into jargon or being unnecessarily obscure. So that was really so that was one thing that happened. That whole process. The other thing that happened is that the book grew enormously who was already you know giving me a lot of leeway for for a random house book uh, so what happened in the midway of the book that i had worked out new versions of these fundamental philosophical arguments i've been working on for a long time but more and more their relation to material economic political social questions became pressing for me more and more and i started to see that connection as i, I was reading marx in a deeper and deeper way and that then sort of grew out the whole second part of the book. So a lot of things happen in the process. And I wasn't sure when you do something like that, you can either hit both targets or miss both targets, you know, both the academic audience and the general audience. But I've been very happy with the reception of the book that it's actually landed both among a wide variety of general readers. I mean, the book has sold a lot and I get a lot of feedback from general readers who are very taken with the book, but it's also had, and it's continuing to have a very serious academic philosophical reception. Next year, Routledge is publishing an entire book on the book, as it were. So like somehow it has actually managed to reach both audiences. So, so I'm very happy about that. And that's very inspiring. Fantastic. And well, what I want to talk to you about, I think, which I think hasn't been taken up in the reception of it, at least in the critical reception reviews and podcasts and the like. And I want to talk to you about a specific chapter, actually. I want to talk to you about chapter four, I think. No, is it chapter four? Chapter four. Yeah. 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 So natural and spiritual freedom. So the book has got two parts to it it's a book about the first part is about so for the listeners is about secular faith and the second part of it is about spiritual freedom and which segs into a discussion of democratic socialism and marx now the element of the book that i'm interested in right is the question about freedom and i'm interested because i think there's another element martin and you can correct me if i'm wrong there is a question of freedom in it and what i mean by that is i'm interested in kind of the the phenomenology of freedom and I think that's not your pre most pressing concern here, but I'm interested in what you have to yeah. say about the, you know, phenomenologies. So the, what it is likeness of freedom, what is it like to be an agent 
in the world in the same way that perhaps that Husserl or Heidegger might talk about it yeah. and that, so hopefully at the end I'll get that from you from this discussion so what I'd like to parse first is this distinction you draw between natural freedom and uh, spiritual freedom and I want to start with the seagull which you start to... yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great 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 beginning <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So you uh, you talk in uh, chapter four uh, at, at the beginning about a seagull. I, I think the point you're drawing is that you're trying to look at a different form of life, a form of natural life. Um, you look at a species that is radically different, I suppose. Well, substantially different to human being, very alien. Yet we have things in common, and that then is what gets you to t- start talking about what freedom means, because a human being is natural. I think in your view is naturally yeah. free and spiritually free. But uh, let's figure out what natural freedom means first. Yeah. So, yeah, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. No, no, I, well, I'm smiling because I'm very happy when you invited me to this and said you want to talk about chapter four. I was so happy to do that because for me, that this chapter really is the heart of the book. It's literally mm-hmm. at the center of the book. It's at the exact middle of the book. But it also is sort of the heart of all the philosophical arguments of the book and in a way my current project sort of grows out of everything in a different re- idiom different register that i'm doing in chapter four so that's just sort of uh, it was a real breakthrough for me to read that chapter and it's probably one of the you're right that it's one of the least discussed chapters even though for me it's really the heart of the book so i'm, I'm really happy that we can devote entire sort of podcast to, to, to digging into that chapter so let's start with this distinction that I make between natural and spiritual freedom. And I mean, the first thing to say there, it's very important that what I call the spiritual or spiritual freedom, spiritual life is not something supernatural. So, and it's not that we have sort of spiritual life or spiritual freedom on top of our natural life. It's rather that like what I call our spiritual freedom is the form of our natural life. It's our way of being living beings, you know, and just to, be clear to listeners that what I call the spiritual has nothing to do with the, as I said, nothing about to do with the supernatural or an immortal soul or some absolute peace of mind that we can achieve through transcendental meditation, levitating in harmony with the universe. That's not what I'm calling the spiritual at all. I'm using the term spiritual in what I take to be Hegel's sense, where Spiritual life in Hegel's sense doesn't refer to anything otherworldly or supernatural. Spiritual life is, is social and historical life. So we are we are spiritual beings because we're social and historical beings. And spiritual questions are social and historical questions. And that's the way I sort of set up that in the opening of the chapter, the way you recall, is that like I start out by talking about uh, sort of the relation between me and another kind of living being in this case, the seagull and what we have in common that we are living beings is that we both have a kind of freedom and we are both beings for whom things matter, for whom things can be good or bad, for whom things can be valuable or not, you know? So any living being, and in this case, for example, I take it, a seagull, is a being for whom its own life is at stake. And because it is the end of itself, because its own life and well-being matters to it, it can discriminate between what is good and bad for it, you know, and it can deter and it has a sort of freedom of self-determination, a freedom of self-movement, all of these things. And and that's very, very important for the sort of argument of the book as a whole to think about this, like what does it mean to be a living being? The book is called This Life, you know, but being a living being doesn't mean just one thing. You can be a living being in different ways. And the distinction I'm drawing there is that like for the seagull, there's, there's a sense of like, what it ought to do, it ought to find fish, it ought to be able to fly, it ought to flourish in its form of life, uh, and it's living its life in light of that ought or that norm, we can say. And that's what I call like a single ought structure for the for, for natural living beings. Right? For, and we do that too, but what's distinctive about our form of life is that like we, we do not just have a good or a notion of flourishing or well-being in light of which we live, we can also call into question and transform that notion of the good or the ideals in light of which we live. So, you know, we can wake up in the middle of the night and ask ourselves what the hell we're doing with our lives, you know, and... Very common, very common. (laughs) Like, what's worth doing? Is this really how I ought to live? That's our distinct form of freedom, uh, which I'm calling spiritual freedom in the book. Whereas 
for the seagull and for other living beings, things their life can be good or bad, but they can't take their very idea of their own life to be bad. That's like, oh yeah, why am I flying around eating fish? I ought to do something else with my life. That anxiety is not an issue for the seagull, but it is for us, and that's going to be key to our distinctive form of freedom. Usually when philosophers talk about freedom, or even, not even philosophers, I think when, yeah. you know, a common sense view of freedom would be, would link it to the question of causality. You know, the, the idea is that if I am yeah. determined... Therefore, I am not free, and I'm determined by sets of physical causes. And if I am free, therefore, I'm not yeah. determined. And if I am free, I am basically self-causing. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Uh, that's the, you know, so it's still a question of causality, but a different type of, of view. And you're, you're not, your yeah. view of freedom is a little bit more complicated than that. So so the seagull, the, the badger, the, uh, the dog, they have forms yeah. of life which are delimited in certain ways, whereas human freedom or spiritual freedom is richer or it's yeah, to do with the yeah. question of recognition really isn't it yeah but let's first just drill down a little bit on this point about because it's very important for me that freedom doesn't begin with human beings or rational animals it, it's transformed and reaches a, a distinct form in in human beings or rational animals but for me it's very important that freedom uh, begins with organic life, as it were, you know, because like freedom is like acting in light of an end that is your own, you know, a non-living being, a stone or a mountain is, uh, we can explicate its being, its, its coming into being, its ceasing to be completely in relation to external forces that hold it together or break it apart, you know, but it doesn't care. It doesn't matter to the stone if you right. break it into a thousand pieces. You just have a bunch of smaller stones and no one has been hurt. No one is suffering, etc. But a living being, an organism, is holding itself together. Its own life matters to it. It's acting for the sake of its own well-being, for the sake of its own flourishing. And that ability to act for the sake of your own good, that's the fundamental form of freedom and self-determination. Uh, which doesn't mean that you're self-sufficient or sovereign. On the contrary, to be a living being, you're essentially dependent on metabolizing nutrients from the environment, on your relation to other living beings, on conditions that are conducive to your life. So you're essentially dependent, but you are self-determining in the sense that uh, what's good or bad for you is determined by your own being and you have what can call like an internal purpose you have and you're acting for the sake of your own end and that's the minimal idea of freedom that we then can see higher and higher forms on but that's sort of where it begins and that then that is a very different angle then you don't have to to establish that a, that a being is free you don't have to go after this impossible idea of something that is self-causing in the sense of ex nihilo being able to bring itself into existence and like a god exactly exactly but uh, the idea is that that's not even an intelligible idea of freedom to be free is for your own life to matter to you and for your own good to matter to you and for that good not to be just externally imposed on you by someone else but to be your own end, to be your own purpose. And that's true of all living organisms, of all living beings, or ends in themselves in this sense, in the sense that the, the purpose of their activity is their own real being, their own good. And that's why we can distinguish between, say, the things that you impose on an animal, say, and that you force them to do, versus the things that they do in light of their own good, in light of their own being. And we can draw that distinction. That's why we can treat other living beings well or poorly. We can care for them in the right or the wrong way, which makes no sense when we talk about inanimate entities such as a stone, because, because it doesn't care about its own well-being. It also doesn't solicit our care in an indeterminate way. But this sort of activity of caring, self-determination, freedom, mattering, all of that begins with living organisms, and it's very important for my argument that we also are all living organisms. We're not something other than living organisms, but we're a distinct kind of organism. And, and I'm trying to show how if we see ourselves that way and see these questions of freedom in that light, we'll have a much better grip 
on the phenomena. Traditionally, philosophers account for that difference that you're articulating there with a split, basically. And I, I know you've got you've done a lot of yeah. work on Derrida. <laughs> I, I can still see some some of your uh, post structuralism at work here, even though I think you've moved away from that a lot, but um, are built on it, let's say. But the you know what do we do? What do philosophers normally do? We deal with it through the nature culture distinction or the fact-value distinction or the, or the or in philosophy the is art distinction you know don't derive facts from don't derive facts from values uh fallacy yeah yeah and uh but what you're saying i think is that uh, well you're collapsing that in some sense that you're saying that this is something i wanted to ask you about this is a lang- this is a, a conceptual distinction that you draw a lot you say things are separate but distinct or separate but are joined in some way so the human is both natural and spiritual so i suppose i'm asking i'm asking you the cartesian question you're not you're not like a dualist you're not saying they're two different substances you know so how do they connect how you know what does it de- how does a despiritualized soul become a spiritual soul yeah yeah absolutely uh, good um and this is also actually at the heart of my current project which sort of deepens this kind of argument and the first important thing to say is that like uh, just to emphasize again that i don't want to say that we are on the one hand, natural, and on the other hand, spiritual, and that we're natural and also spiritual. What I'm calling our gotcha. spiritual form of life, our spiritual freedom, is a distinct form of organic life. So what you have, you don't have what philosophers often call a layer cake, where like, okay, so we're animals, and on top of that, we can ask these rational questions or spiritual questions. Uh, it's rather that the whole way of being an animal is transformed with us. That's why we're a distinct kind of animal, where like the very way we sustain our lives, the very way we nourish ourselves is always implicated with these questions about like what's worth eating, what's justifiable to eat, you know, uh, and whether our life is good or not, all the way down in our very being is inseparable from this, our sense of like what's a dignified life, what's a worthwhile life, and our sort of self-relation in those normative terms permeates everything. Whereas like for other living beings, they have a notion of the good and what's worth doing, but that itself is not in question for them. Whether they succeed to flourish or succeed to nourish themselves and to have a form of well-being, that's an issue for them. But the way in which the question of value and what's worth doing and what's how we should live our lives. That's a question that doesn't just emerge on top of us living our basic life. It's like permeates our entire way of being. So, so, so that's the first thing to say that like that, that, uh, because otherwise you would have a sort of dualism, uh, which is the traditional way people have thought yeah, about a difference in kind, two different substances an animal within that we're trying to master through our rational capacities. No, what I want to say is that our rationality is a distinct form of animality and our animality is a distinct form of rationality. One of the things you say then is that because of that, you say that natural yeah. freedom, you say, uh, you, you refer to, reference to it already, has a single ought structure. Okay? And you say... Spiritual freedom yep. has a, a double art structure. And if you don't mind, Martin, I'll read some of your, your book back at you. Uh, and you say, uh, natural freedom yep. has a single art structure okay. since the agent cannot question its guiding principles and asks itself what it ought to do. Spiritual freedom, by contrast, is characterized by a double art structure. As a spiritually free yep. being, I can ask myself what I ought to do since I am answerable not only for my actions, but also for the normative principles that guide my actions. There are not only demands concerning what I ought to do. There is also the question, if if I ought to do yeah. what I supposedly ought to do. So it's kind of like a meta question on top of the... Yeah. Great, great. Uh, thanks for reading that. Um, very importantly there, it's, it's also not supposed to be two steps there that I like first have an ought and then in the second step I can step back and ask myself, is that really what I ought to do? It's rather we have that sense of our reasons in a form where they are continuing that issue that we have a sort of minimal anxiety about our own reasons, you know? So one way of thinking about this single odd double odd structure is it's helpful to think all living beings act for reasons. Even a plant has 
for the sake of its own well-being, it turns towards the sun or stretches its roots, etc. Uh, but it's only with the kinds of living beings we are that the reasons themselves, whether they are good or bad reasons, is that issue. And even though that can become most dramatic when our way of life is challenged or what, as I mentioned before, when we wake up in the middle of the night and ask ourselves what the hell we're doing, that's, that just brings into light something that is always minimally at work. That is to say that like in living our lives, what matters to us is not just whether we succeed or fail, but whether our very standards of the good life are adequate, justifiable, are what they ought to be. And, and that both makes our lives much more difficult because we don't know what it means to flourish for us. And we can have very bad ideas of the good life. A cat or a beaver or a seagull, it can't be wrong about what the good life is for it. Now, we can ruin their lives or things can go bad for them and there's no food or they break their legs or their wings, but they can't have a wrong idea of how they ought to live. Whereas it's only the kind of animals we are who don't know how they're supposed to live. That's part of who we are. We're born as that distinct kind of animal who doesn't know how it's supposed to live. All other organisms have the, the, what counts as flourishing for them. They can't be wrong about that. So that makes our lives much more difficult and challenging, but it's also the key to understanding the kind of responsibility we have and the kind of freedom we have. And have you been criticized for that? Now, given my, I know you come from, well, you, you come from a, I think, quasi-religious background, Martin, you told me once. Uh, you come from sort of a Protestant background, is it? Is, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah. I, I come from a, uh, the other side. I come from a Catholic background. And uh, yeah. what you were saying there, right? If, if I said that to my like local priest when I was going up, he would probably think you were the devil incarnate for that kind of rhetoric because it's, what you're saying effectively is there is that our freedom, our sort of emancipation, the emancipation of our yeah. souls is tied up with the question of contingency. And he yeah. would say, that's nihilism, that's relativism, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I, I mean, have you got those types of criticisms? <laughs> You're smiling again. Very impish, Martin, today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. I mean, I think actually uh, I've received less of that than one perhaps would expect. But I think that's also tied to that I, since I'm a certain kind of Hegelian, like I do think that like even though that we can learn historically uh to distinguish between better and worse ways of living and that we have to learn what sort of institutions and way of recognizing one another that are conducive to a flourishing life. It's just that like that's not given to us either by nature the way it is for other living beings or from above in some supernatural way, but it's something that we have to learn and that then we're responsible for that we have to sustain. And Gradually in the book, I am working out a notion of like what the principles of a good flourishing life would be. But that's something that we always have to justify in practice and that we have to learn historically through our various failures of like ways of living with one another that are inimical to the kinds of beings we are and the kinds of responsibility we have towards one another, etc. So, yeah, I think, yeah, go ahead. Well, Sorry to put in, Martin. I suppose as the strength of the book, and that's why I raised the question, is the strength of the book is because it's book is not prescriptive per se. It doesn't give you a blueprint. It doesn't give you moral moral arts. It doesn't give you many shoulds or it doesn't give you particular practices. But that's absolutely essential to your argument because that's what freedom is. It's, for, it's the doing of the things which are free, which we, we can hold to ourselves to account and hold others to account and our obligations. So our freedom... Yeah. Gosh, I can see the Hegelianism now. Our freedom is tied up with all these necessary things that we're involved in. Is that right? Or are all these obligations, institutions, and things like that? Absolutely, because another notion of freedom that is very common that we haven't talked about yet and that I distinguish my point strongly from is this idea that freedom is being able to do whatever you want. Oh, yeah, freedom is caprice, yeah. Yeah, caprice or arbitrary willing and so on. And... I don't think that's even an intelligible idea of freedom, but the idea, the, the, the idea is rather that like 
this distinct kind of freedom I'm talking about is the freedom, it's sort of freedom as responsibility that, that you're answerable and accountable for your actions and, your, and, and our shared notions of the good and whether those are actually sustainable and rational ways of living and working together, all of that, that sort of responsibility. And I think one feature I want to mention here too, because since we're focusing on chapter four, because a very important argument in that chapter that I don't think has been taken up really at all is I'm arguing against what is now a very prevalent trend in certain strands of, of the humanities, which is this idea that like, well, actually, Posthumanism, yeah. We shouldn't make any distinction between the kinds of animals we are and, and other animals or other living beings. And that that's this sort of posthumanist argument that the root of our mistreatment of other species or of the environment or other animals is that that we distinguish ourselves from them. And I have a sort of what I think is an important engagement with that argument because and that clarifies the sort of distinction I'm making that like, now, of course, there have been ways of privileging human beings that have been used to sort of legitimize our exploitation of nature or our mistreatment of other animals, etc. And criticizing that is totally worthwhile. But, you know, the very people who do that, to do that, you have to understand ourselves as to think in another way that we are spiritually free in a way that other animals are not, because even these people, they would never criticize lions for being sexist, you know, or killing other animals or destroying the environment, you know, that would be absurd. Or, or uh, whereas like they do hold us accountable rightly for how we live our lives and how we treat other species. But that's already recognizing implicitly that we are the kinds of beings who can hold ourselves accountable and be held accountable for how we live our lives. And if you deny that uh, and try to level the distinction, then you only have two options. Either, you know, if you want to hold us accountable by leveling the distinction between us and other animals, then you must conclude that all animals should be held responsible for their actions. And, you know, you must take them to the task for murder, rape, environmental destruction, etc. Or, uh, if you can see that they can't be held accountable and still say that we're no different from them, then you must also let us off the hook and say, we have no responsibility for how we live our lives and how we treat other species. So like, this is part of why it's sort of an ontological or transcendental argument that like, understanding ourselves as free in this responsible sense is not optional because as soon as you argue anything or make any claim, on yourself or on others, you necessarily assume that sort of freedom or responsibility. And you make a distinction between the kinds of beings who are responsible, have that sort of responsibility and accountability and those that do not. Now, that doesn't mean, as I also point out, that there couldn't be other living beings, other animals who have what I call spiritual freedom, who have that kind of responsibility. That's an empirical question. What I'm specifying philosophically is what it means to be that kind of animal, what it means to be that kind of living being. And once we understand that, I don't think we have any empirical evidence that there are other animals, but that's not excluded, or they could be on other planets, etc. But what matters philosophically is like distinguishing and being clear on both what the difference between the living and the non-living in is, and then also what different kinds of living beings there can be, and what's at stake in those differences, and what different kinds of responsibilities that entails. And singling out ourselves in this way is not to, the point of that is to insist not on our sovereignty or sovereign right to exploit everything else, but rather our unique form of responsibility to ourselves, to one another, to the environment, to other living species and so on. I suppose the post-human critique of, say, I don't know, say someone like Donna Haraway or uh, Catherine Hales would be that you are privileging human exceptionalism and you are setting the human being above the environment. But your argument would be, in, in response, that no, we are part of this reciprocal world of mutual obligations, which include the world, which includes other species, which includes animals, and that you're actually giving them their due difference. You're trying to understand them as the creatures that they are. Yes, and my point would also be that they, 
it's a sort of bad faith argument because they themselves must make a distinction between us and other living beings or the kinds of living beings we are and other, uh, otherwise uh, because it's one thing to say which we absolutely should say yes we also are organisms we also are necessarily implicated with environmental conditions we do not transcend or stand above organic embodiment that's the very form of our freedom that's compatible with saying we are a distinct kind of organism and we're distinguished precisely by that for us there's a question how do we ought to live is our conception of the good life actually good and justifiable and that question is an issue for us and that's why we can be held accountable and hold ourselves accountable and and all of these people like Haraway or Hales etc they must assume that even though they don't theorize that they must make the distinction themselves because otherwise again they couldn't criticize us for all the bad things that they're criticizing us for because we're not and they also would then have to criticize other species for how they live and they don't do that because obviously that would be absurd <laughs> indeed and so so it's not like i'm saying oh yeah you can choose one of these positions i'm saying the other position is not coherent it's actually self-refuting because again if you're really going to say that i want to level the distinction between kinds of organisms that again you could say there could be other beings that are not human beings but but if you're going to say that all living beings are sort of like that they are not ontologically distinct ways of being, then again, either you have to hold all living species morally responsible for what they do, or you have to let us off the hook completely. I <laughs> see. Now that's nihilism, basically. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Because. And they can't do either one of those things, and they don't do either one of those things, which means that there's a discrepancy between the for itself of the theory and the in itself of the theory. Very great. Yeah, that's good Hegelian stuff there, Martin. Now, uh, the other thing, I want to talk now a bit more about what it means for the human to be free, or what it is like for the human being free. Yeah. And I got another quote from you here, a shorter one, Martin, if you don't mind. The concept of life is self-maintaining, must therefore be distinguished from any idea of life as self-sufficient. You've mentioned this already. The form of self-maintenance is not a form of sovereignty, but a form of finitude. The reason a living being must maintain and reproduce itself is because it is not self-sufficient, but susceptible to disintegration and death. Now, if there's a, a if there's a paragraph that sums up Martin Hagler's work, I think it might be that one. You know, that's very yeah. that's very sort of typical of of, of of your of your of your writing. And what I want to talk about with you is the connection between the question of meaning, value, and the question of of freedom itself. So traditionally, I think, if you yeah. look back to Aristotle, yeah. where freedom is sort of eudaimonia, this kind yeah. of sort of self-sufficient flourishing. We, we, we cultivate all these practices across our lives and they become self-reinforcing, say, you know, whatever yeah. the virtues are, the dispositions, as you would call them. And when we talk about meaning in a common sense way, again, yeah. we, would, we, we, we do link it with fullness, don't we? We link it with sovereignty. You know, my life is complete, we say, and uh, I don't have to do anything else I, if, if, uh, yeah. when I when I when I we reach that stage. And that is what we think of when we think of meaning or having meaning or the meaning of yeah. life. Uh, we say that always. It's, it's a full life. We even say it's full that we are leading, not not a life that is empty or a life that is alienated. I'm trying to see what your response would be to that link between freedom yeah. and and meaning and the meaning of life. Which is, which is effectively what your book is about, Martin. You know, why mortality makes us free. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I want to make a distinction. When we talk about eudaimonia that you refer to in Aristotle, or like the good life, well-being, flourishing. Uh, and this is actually at the center of my current book project, uh, but it's also directly relevant for, for this life. And rather than saying, Yes, it's true that one conception of eudaimonia or full flourishing uh, is this idea of completion and sovereignty, uh, such that, like, if you were truly flourishing, uh, right. then your life would be complete and you would be independent and self-sufficient. You know, I mean, that's certainly how Aristotle talks about 
why it's the gods, you know. Now, it's very important for me that, like, while I take issue with such a conception of the good, it is, and this is especially true with regard to Aristotle, it's an imminent critique in the sense that, like, just thinking about what flourishing is, and especially with Aristotle, he himself gives us so many resources to reconceive that as a form of living activity. And as soon as we see that what flourishing is, what well-being is, what a meaningful life is, what the good is, is not a state that you can reach in a form of a completion, uh, but it's an activity that has to be sustained, uh, then we have a sort of different dynamic living conception of the good, where like, even in the fullest flourishing, there's always the risk of falling apart, there is vulnerability, etc. But that's part of the very living animation, because completion is it's not that we can't reach it. It's that like, if things were complete, in the sense of like you have reached a goal and there's nothing more to do, that's precisely death. You can't conceptualize, conceptually separate that from a notion of, from a notion of death. So I make this distinction in the book between like a goal and a purpose. But a goal is something that you can reach, and when you reach it, you're done. And whereas a purpose, it's it's not something that can be completed and that you can reach from the bra, it's that in light of which the goal matters. So, you know, if I if I have a goal to get tenure, I can be on the tenure track and I want to be done with it, and then I get tenure and it's done, and I don't and and, and it's over and done that, that is completed. But that only makes sense in light of the purpose of say being a professor. And being a professor, living the life of a professor, it, that that is I can flourish or wither, it can be good or bad, but it's not something that you complete. What it's what it means to be a professor is to be engaged in the activity of teaching and learning and writing and thinking. And that can be interrupted with death, but the end, the purpose, the point is to sustain it and to flourish in that activity. And that sort of purpose has a priority, explanatory priority over any goal, because it's only in light of such a purpose that it can matter to achieve any goal, such as getting tenure, for example, that you couldn't explain why that's meaningful, why it matters, unless there was a purpose for the sake of which it matters. And the purpose for the sake of which is not, again, it's not a goal, a state of being that you can reach and be complete and done once and for all. No, it's the, the purpose of being professor. It's a practice that you have to sustain. And that means that sort of vulnerability, fragility, responsibility, dependence on others is part of fulfillment itself. It's part of the highest good itself. It's part of what it means to be someone and to be alive and to flourish in the fullest sense. So we're not even asymptotically trying to get to self-sufficiency, but reconceiving what the good and what fulfillment is and what flourishing is in these interdependent, active but fragile senses, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, so effectively, I think what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that freedom is in some sense recognizing ourselves yeah. in what we do. Our yes. Freedom is indexed to activity. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a very important point. And this is one of the most important Hegelian strands of the, of the book that like, exactly as you said, that like, Freedom is being able to see yourself in what you do to, and again, the, the example I just gave is a good one that like in a profession or uh, anything that you're pursuing, there is, if I'm free, say in my practice of being professor, that doesn't mean that I'm constrained and I can do whatever I want and I don't have mm -hmm. to care about what my students think or what my colleagues think, etc. I'm constrained in what ways right. you know uh, so it's not a freedom from constraints but it's free whereas i can affirm those constraints and the practice as an end in itself as something that makes my life worth living as something that i'm doing for its own sake and that's the key to sort of uh, a free understanding 
it's a very concrete way of understanding freedom. And that's why like Hegel's like, the examples of freedom are always these sort of friendship, love, these ways in which you are dependent on someone else, but you can see yourself in the relation and you can affirm the demands of the relation as demands you place on yourself. And that's like freedom is the, the, the privilege of being able to put yourself at stake in that activity and take on those responsibilities and demands just as like, we all know if we're lucky enough that like in our teaching or writing that can be a profound experience of freedom in and through like all the demands and constraints that it involves because you can see that that these are demands you place on yourself and it's an activity that matters for its own sake precisely as a social activity it sounds hard martin it sounds difficult your freedom is like which i think is your point right yeah. it's not easy again it's not caprice as you said earlier it's not voluntary will that i can i can just do do willy-nilly it's a demanding freedom a difficult freedom yes that's where it's very hard and but it's very important that it's just and that the difficulty should not be located just like yeah it's difficult to muster the strength of you as an individual to do this part of the co collective social point that emerges in part two is that like whether that the way we are socially formed and the form of life into which we're born and how we're habituated and socialized that is everything is at stake in that way because whether that enables or disables living that kind of life taking that kind of responsibility and that's going to have everything to do with this critique of capitalism and so on that emerges in the second half of the book. But really, uh, but on this more general level that we're not talking, it's just important to see that like, if freedom is not freedom from social life, but the freedom to be engaged in social life, it's difficulty also has to do with that, like the very social conditions that enable or disable me to grow into my ability for that sort of responsibility and freedom you know, it's not something that I can bootstrap myself into and it's going to have everything to do with how we live and work together and what sort of form of life we're born into and that that enables or disables us. So Marx's notion that we're social individuals is so important for the book that like I don't want to choose between emphasizing individuality and sociality. I want to think individuality as essentially social. And that way you can both highlight the challenges of freedom from this first personal standpoint, but you can also see how it's inseparable from this second personal and third personal social form of life perspective. And both of those things we have to keep in place rather than think that we have to choose between them. Yeah, because in the book you, well, it's, it's impossible to not get into the political side of it or the political economy yeah. side of, of, of your book because capitalism is the form of life which pro, or, uh, mitigates our ability to be free and to recognize ourselves as free. So, but so yeah. just sort of prior to that, before we talk about that, you know, I think the what's important, I think, I think for the listeners to try and think of when thinking about being free, I think one of your formulations is it's when we are free, we're not a subject to, but a subject of, which implies the political dimension yes. because it's, it's, it requires participation, agent to, participation uh, as well we're not dominated or we're not coerced yeah. or we're not controlled in some way we are involved that's yeah. not that's well that's inimical into alienation yeah i think you list three traits you might have developed this since but so not being a subject to but a subject of yeah. freedom demands bearing a negative self-relation so if a degree of contingency has to be yeah. inherent that's inescapable it's yeah. ineliminable and you also say which is the political question par excellence, I guess, for your work, is freedom is the ability to ask what to do with my time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Absolutely. And I'm really glad that we're sort of focusing on these fundamental philosophical structures uh, in, in the chapter. So those traits, as I do, also, is like it's important that they have a prior version in other forms of life. So that's just, just to see this relation between natural sure. freedom and spiritual freedom, natural life and spiritual life, I think it's helpful. Uh, so because the three traits you just mentioned, let me first just walk through briefly how they are embodied in, in other forms of life and then the, the, the way they are transformed in our form of life. Uh, so it's very interesting, right, that like, uh, in a minimal sense, at least, all living beings, all living organisms are subjects 
of their lives in the sense that we can distinguish between what happens to them and what they are doing. You know, that's, that's, you immediately have a subject when you can distinguish between, say, an action and event that way. You know, like we can distinguish between, you know, if you have a dog, what your dog is doing and say what, you know, a rock falls on its head and it passes out. That's, that's an event. It happens to it. Or, you know, someone is constraining it or locking it up. That's something that happens to the dog. It's not something that the dog is doing. It's something that is subject to. But at the same time, it's a subject of its life because we can distinguish that from the things that the dog is doing uh, out of its own being, as it were, and for the sake of its own life. And it's precisely, it's only when you have something that is a subject of in that way that we can even think about like questions of domination or coercion or mistreatment, right? So it's intelligible, not just in relation to human beings, but in relation to other living beings, that they are being mistreated or dominated, coerced, subject to constraints that are external, precisely because they're subjects of. Whereas like a non-living entity, that makes no sense because it's not a subject of its own life, you know? So uh, now what happens with spiritual freedom, with spiritual life, is that the way we are subjects of our lives is not just that we have a good, as we said, that we act in light of, but that that good itself is an issue for us and we are in some sense responsible for it and we can come to question it or transform it uh, like you know uh the principles in light of which we lead our lives as subjects right and yeah so and then the second trait the sort of negative self-relation there too we can see like for other animals they can bear a negative separation in the sense of like they can suffer from pain let's say like how can you suffer from pain it's because even when you're wounded or afflicted you're minimally still holding yourself together so you can bear that negative separation that's the difference between being in pain and dying you know if someone hurts your dog it can suffer from the pain precisely because it's still able to like counteract that negative impact and hold itself together short of death as it were uh, but for us, that means that like that negative separation is not just a matter of that sort of pain. It's also a matter of the pain of like we we can experience that we betrayed ourselves or our principles or our ideals, and we can suffer from that. And even that negative experience reminds us of our freedom and our responsibility. And then the third trait, most importantly, has to do with this free time point that you mentioned. That like once again, it's very important for my argument that all living organisms through their very activity of sustaining their lives, generate a surplus of time that, that is true, even already on the, on the vegetative level, but for, say, animals, that's why it's intelligible that certain kinds of animals have time to purr and play and enjoy themselves because they sort of like, they generate this free time that they don't have to spend all their time on just making sure that they don't die. They generate lifetime that, that can be used for activities that are forms of self-enjoyment or valuable in themselves. And again, here, but for us then, we also generate that sort of surplus time, but we can actually understand it as free time and we can ask ourselves what's worth doing with it, what's not worth doing with it. And that's then another facet of our of our freedom that is very important. So just in terms of that, what is it like to be a first person? Yeah. What do you understand what a first person agent is yeah. like when they're free? Normally, we, we, we define freedom quite negatively, like, you know, freedom is freedom from, freedom from slavery, freedom from oppression, yeah. freedom coercion, our behaviors, you know, sexism, misogyny, homophobia, whatever. So does your sense of freedom imply a sense of spontaneity? And I don't mean spontaneity as in like yeah. jumping out and being funny all of a sudden. I mean more in the sense that our yeah. consciousness, consciousness is continually self-generated. Kant is in the background here yes. in my thoughts, I think. How do we, and I've been, I suppose I've been reading a bit of Nagel as well recently, Martin, but oh, yeah. yeah, so how do we negotiate the first person and the third person, basically, as free beings, you know, because in Kant, I can see you know, that kind of spontaneity of our conscious awareness is a prerequisite of freedom. Is that something that comes into factor, you factor in? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 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 no, no, that's great, that's great. So two steps here, I mean, because one step it's helpful to understand 
uh, with regard to Kant, and then one can think about, then I want to say something about how it's try to radicalize that and transform that Kantian move via Hegel. But the first thing to say is that like one of the things that Kant really was the first right. to first articulate is that like from a first person standpoint, we must understand ourselves as free in the sense that the question of what we ought to do and what we ought to believe is irreducible, constitutive of our first person standpoint as agents. That question can never go away. So we're constitutively free in that sense. And again, not in the sense that we can do whatever we want, but that the question of what we ought to do, what's worth doing or not worth doing, what we ought to believe or ought not to believe, that those questions are, are, are sort of built into our very first person standpoint. And there's no way of, and Kant is doing this, it's like, you know, so it's like, instead of trying to prove that from a first, first person standpoint that we're free, he wants to show that we necessarily must understand ourselves as free from a first person standpoint. And there's something very powerful about that argument. But if one leaves it at that, it still invites this skeptical question about that, that there could be like a total disjunct between how we understand ourselves from a first person standpoint and what we are from a third person standpoint, say just determined by mechanical forces. And Kant said like, well, I'll take that settlement. We'll stick about what we are third personally. I'm going to make this first personal point. Hegel found that, I think, rightly very dissatisfying. And instead, and the key to establishing that why that spontaneity is not just something subjective, that is going to be linked to this question of like what it means to be a living being and seeing that like there is a form of spontaneity that begins just with organic form and that we are a higher version of that, but not something other than that. And that way one can sort of come to understand, we don't have to understand that ability in sort of supernatural terms, but it's linked to the kind of living being we are. And then the additional step is also to think about like, even though that question of what we ought to do is there constitutively, and we are constitutively free in that sense, there are real questions of the historical conditions that enable us to develop and fully actualize that freedom as the freedom of being accountable for our deeds and accountable to others. And that's the second thing that Kant is that Hegel is going to try to radicalize out of Kant, saying like, well, first we have to understand this freedom, this considered freedom in naturalistic organic terms. But then second, we have to see that it's inseparable, it's distinct but inseparable from the historical question of freedom about like, and we have to learn to uh, grow into that ability and, and we can have forms of life that even though we're free in this minimal sense, they're so inimical to our ability to take responsibility for our lives that it's not like we're not free, but that we are alienated from our freedom. And the whole question of historical emancipation has to do with developing a form of life that will enable that, that freedom to flourish rather than be maimed and disabled by by our form of life. We should talk about some of the political dimensions of this um, because it's so important to the, to the book. Uh, Marx, I think for you, is a theorist of freedom. That's one of the things I find quite striking about your the way you do Marx. I think Marxists, yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit unfair here. I'm being making a huge generalization. But often I find Marxists forget the question of freedom. And Mar Marx gives us a theory of emancipation, right? That's what it's all about. And, you know, yeah. in contemporary leftist discourse, you get critiques yeah. of neoliberalism, you get critiques of social democracy and all these things. And uh, they usually have ceded the question of freedom to the right, Basically, you know, it's it's the it's the leftists who are coming, you know, after your free speech yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So I suppose, uh, yes, I guess that's what I'm asking. Then is like trying yeah, to yeah. figure out what is the well for you, it's democratic socialism, isn't it? That's what enables, what what puts the practices in place which enable freedom to flourish. Yeah. Well, so uh, good. First thing, importantly, as you alluded to, is that one of the motivations. For the book as a whole is to develop sort of from the ground up this positive conception of freedom that i try to show then is sort of the foundation for marxist thinking precisely to counteract this idea that like freedom is 
is is a sort of right wing concept, and the left is about equality instead of freedom or something like that. Uh, and I don't think we should choose between equality and freedom, but I do think that the sort of distinct notion of freedom that grounds Marx's imminent critique of capitalism, one has to sort of really understand what that is, and that and that ultimately having to do with the freedom as you know, being able to own the question and take responsibility for the question of what we do with our time, how we live and work together. And for a long time, especially the uh, Althusser, appeals to freedom and problems of alienation in Marx was seen as this outdated humanism that relied on some idea of human essence from which we have been alienated. That's how Althusser read the, the young Marx. What I try to show is that that's a severe misreading because the point of thinking about alienation this term is not that like, oh, we once were these pristine human beings and then through capitalism or other historical forces, we've been alienated from it. No, it's very, very important that if we understand our freedom as the ability to own the question of what to do with our time, then our ability to do that can only develop historically and what we're alienated from is not some essence from but from that capacity that has to be developed historically and that and capitalism as a form of life plays an essential part of that historical progress so we can see both why capitalism has to be overcome but also why it is progress relative to previous forms of life because it opened up these questions of of time and how we work in in in, in new ways so like that's a sort of um I mean, there are many details to this argument, but like the overall point has to do with like, if we can understand why, what's wrong with our current form of life, and rather than just abstractly condemn capitalism or injustice or exploitation, if we, I think the task is so that we have to develop a rigorous account of why our current form of life is inimical to our flourishing, why it needs to be overcome, but understand that in imminent terms such that like, yeah, it, it has notions of freedom and equality that became possible through this form of life that are being contradicted by it. So we have to sort of work out the dynamic. That's one thing the book is doing. But then we also have to take responsibility and articulate what we are striving for, what we are fighting for, and what would be the principles form of, for a form of life that was not subject to that sort of alienation and domination. And those two tasks I tried to work out in the book, so it'd be as rigorous as possible about both what the imminent contradiction of capitalism is, what would be required to overcome it. And I think that's been another appeal of the book for a lot of readers, just that like both on the negative side of the critique of capitalism and on the positive side of an emancipatory vision, yeah, I try to work both of those things out in terms of like uh, a notion of freedom and like why it's not intelligible to even see something as oppressive or dominating or alienating unless you have a notion of freedom in light of which that shows up as oppression, alienation and domination. And we have to take responsibility for that and articulate not just a negative, but a substantial positive socialist notion of freedom that has the power to counteract the uh, right wing version of, of freedom. And also, I think probably some left wing <laughs> versions of freedom as well. Absolutely. I mean, you're not you're not into totalitarianism, Martin. I think. No, no, yeah, exactly. And, and and I mean, like left is uh, left wing, right wing is way too crude because there. Of course. There's a lot of lot of uh, both historical tendencies on the left and contemporary tendencies of the left, of which I'm very critical. But the mode of critique I'm trying to practice is imminent critique, right? So it's not just like, oh, you have a coherent position and you're just wrong. But rather seeing like, no, see the internal contradictions. It's just that when we talk about post-humanism, I'm trying to show like, it's not that I just criticize you from the outside and disagree with you. I'm trying to show that you're disagreeing with yourself and that the deeper commitments you have can be done justice to and be actualized with this transformation. And that's sort of how I try to practice critique. So I even have an intake of people like Hayek and so on these grounds. You know, it's, I think it's very, very important for a Hegelian Marxian perspective and for the right kind of philosophical critique that the critique is always imminent, that you locate the resources within the position you're criticizing, its own contradictions, 
and thereby the resources for its own overcoming. And I do that both in relation to prominent left-wing thinkers, but also in relation to prominent right-wing thinkers like Hayek and so on. Well, what I find refreshing about it is you do tackle some shibboleths of uh, both left and right thinking. So, so for example, like you, know, you talk about no disrespect, but like, you know, you critique social democracy, you know, this idea on the left that if everyone, if the world turned into Sweden, everything would be yeah. wonderful. And I'm, I'm sure it would be, I'm sure it's lovely, it would be a, yeah. a big step in the right direction. Or U UBI, for example, so universal basic income. That's, so what I like about it is you tackle, well, panaceas really, deus ex machinas that come yeah. along and go, okay, this explains everything. BI will solve automation, it will solve all the problems that we have. And you say that we need to do more difficult work, really. Uh, and it's a, a democratic work, yeah. I think, because that's the other side of the equation is socialism, but it's democratic socialism, which you say is absolutely essential to, to Marx's yeah. view. And I think I think you said this in the book, don't you? You say that you know Marx's favorite, yeah. you know, each according to his needs and each according to his abilities became distorted in yeah. Stalinism. I think which was each according to his needs is each according to his work. Is that right or his labor? Yeah. yeah. Well, Marx, I, th I think you quote this as well, doesn't he? He says, uh, "Democracy is the the answer to all yeah. con the of all constitutions." Something to that effect, if I recall. Right, but then democracy, then, but also then explaining why the capitalist mode of production is such as to disable us from be, being able to take responsibility by why we produce what we produce and you know such as like the actual realization of democracy would require the overcoming of capitalism you know and these sorts of very large claims i'm trying to ground them imminently and in great detail by like taking seriously the ideas of democracy and freedom and equality that we already have and showing why they are not accidentally, but for the reasons contradicted by capitalism as a form of life. And that's also then what undergirds the critique of those who think that redistribution or social democracy or universal basic income can solve the basic issues that Marx identifies. No, on the contrary, the the painful and difficult truth is that that there's a sort of much more systematic revolutionary transformation that is needed. But what I think a philosophical account like mine can do is just provide a deeper understanding of those dynamics and a deeper understanding of also the ideas of freedom in light of which this shows up to us as as something that needs to be overcome, and then. That's necessary, but not sufficient, because then there is all the sort of practical political work, etc. But I see these things as working in tandem, and I'm trying to contribute to the sort of theoretical, philosophical side of this, while recognizing that it's not sufficient on its own. Now, I've, I've only got a couple of more questions for you, Martin. Well, I, I'm, I'd be interested to see what, what is next uh, in terms of, of your work. Yeah. And I think you alluded to your yeah. current work a number of times throughout our discussion. I was wondering what is um, what is going to be the next extension of, uh, of this life? Yeah, good. So I'm working on this project, which is going to be a two-volume project, ultimately. So, But the first volume is really on the what we can call the ontological conditions of freedom as grounded in organic form and living organisms and so on. So it's really like a oh, how exciting. deepening and expansion of what I did in chapter four of this life. So it's a sort of fundamental ontology of life and freedom. That's going to like sort of do the groundwork for the second volume, which is sort of about the social and historical conditions for the actualization of freedom. So very much what happens in the second half of this life from chapter four onwards. I had a lot of breakthroughs when I was doing that, but to really fully work out those arguments and also take them further and partially revise them, I need this sort of different scope of a project, which I'm involved in now. So, and right now I'm in the midst of writing this. The, um, it's about the organic form of any possible mind that's worth rethinking sort of mindedness, freedom, and all these things that's like, yeah, why they have to be organic, not in the sense that it has to be made of a certain organic material, but like being an organism, what that is as a form of activity that is essentially interdependent and fragile and mortal and so on. And that's that a very condition of possibility for mindedness and freedom and ultimately responsibility. Will this involve vitalism? It's a critique of vitalism, but it's also a critique of like any if you don't grasp that like 
to be a self is necessarily to be an organism or that only an organism can be can be minded only an organism can have mind. anything other than that is ultimately going to have to fall into some form of a dualism between mind and body or form and matter etc and truly think them as inseparable one reads the sort of organic logic that i'm trying to work out through a radicalization of aristotle first of all and then sort of drawing that further so but that intersects also with like also these questions of AI and sort of philosophy of mind and all these things. But but more and more the way I, when I've started thinking about like what it means to be an organism, what the organic form is, that's such a powerful way through in a new way a lot of classical philosophical issues. And that's then ultimately also connected to these questions of emancipation and life and work, mm. because as Marx emphasized, you know, it's a question of our metabolism with nature. And metabolic activity is organic activity, and we have to understand the kinds of organisms we are, but also the other kinds of organisms there are, and being able to distinguish them without positing something over and above it. And yeah, so the, um, that's the plan. That's the plan. So it's a lot of work. Uh, and then the other thing I'm doing is that, so as I mentioned, Bradford is publishing this volume on this life with a lot of responses from philosophers and political theorists. So. I'm writing a long response essay for that. That would be like mm. 30,000 words, basically. That's, and that's a great opportunity for me to further develop a lot of the arguments of the book, but also the emancipatory vision of the book, what a life beyond capitalism would be. So I'm very grateful for all the serious engagement that pushes me on these questions. And that's sort of, I'm finishing that this winter. So that's the other thing I'm doing. Last question, Martin. Between the publishing of the books, I think it was like 2019, yeah. or late 2019, if I recall, that This Life came out. After that, you became, well, you got married, you became a father. Yeah. I'm asking a personal question now, Martin, if it's okay. Um, did that change or deepen your views on the book? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly deepens it in lots of ways. And it's very, and as I'm now working on these questions of like what it means to be a living being and then also what it means to be a carer a rational animal, an animal we are it's extremely moving and powerful to be actually part of another living being growing into her form as with my daughter and it's i've always felt that like philosophical reflection for me it has to be expressive of the what we're already living and experiencing and it has to be accountable to that so it's a very it's 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 a very powerful reciprocal determination between the thinking and the and and, and the and the parenting because i so i mean i obviously learned lots of things personally through this sort of responsibility and care but i also learn a lot philosophically and and for me like when those things come together then i know that i'm like working on the things that I can see myself in, as it were, and hence I'm doing a free activity. So really trying to think about what is habituation, what is that need to grow into your form, why is it so difficult to be the kind of animal who we are? Those questions become very vivid when you're actually like in the midst of uh, helping to, 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 to raise another human being and someone who... So uh, it, it's an alignment of, of a lot of things, of everything really. That's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We should finish there, I think, man. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you so much, Pat.